Hello everyone and welcome to mass media or electronic media as the case may be. This is class 9 which would be week 9 in most of your schedules and today we're going to talk about more television. We talked about broadcast TV last week and today we're going to expand that to cable TV and public TV and satellites and streaming and all of that. And then we have uh, also uh, ratings and things like that. And later on we will talk about news TV. TV is kind of a big subject and it's kind of encompassing uh, a lot of mass media uh, with internet and streaming and online and all that kind of stuff. So um, it, it is a big subject and so off we go with part two of our three parts on television. So first off we're going to talk about ratings services and this is very important believe it or not because this is where all the money comes from and one way to look at television and radio and things like that is a bunch of ads surrounded by content because ads are what pay the bills. Ads bring in the money to pay for the studios and the directors and the actors and the actresses and the lights and all that kind of stuff so there wouldn't be any entertainment uh, if it was adver uh, that as advertiser supported. Sorry about that. And remember, the other way is subscription. So there's two ways to pay for all this stuff. Either we're going to pay up front, like Netflix or HBO, or we're going to have ads. Everything has to get paid for. Everybody also wants to know, uh, especially in advertiser supported, but even in subscription, even HBO and Netflix, they still want to know who is watching or listening to the content. So rating services, uh, uh, originated way back in the days of radio in the 1920s and 1930s and the main uh, service today is Nielsen they do television and Arbitron does radio and they had a long history together but they eventually found their own niche and that's the way it is today and again this is pretty important because this is going to determine where the money goes so of course demographics are going to come into play. Very, very important. Age, sex, uh, geographic, where you are, and ethnicity and education. And uh, I, I sincerely don't believe that studios or networks or advertisers care one whit about if you are, uh, if you are white or black or brown or yellow or Christian, or Hindu, or Muslim. I don't really think they care. Uh, it really, for uh, networks and studios and advertisers and all that, comes down to uh, business. They want to know what things we're going to buy. So I don't think it's a it's a, a ageist. I don't think it's a sexist. I don't think. Now this is my personal opinion, but really they don't they don't really seem to care. And witness uh, a number of years ago. Uh, uh, advertising to uh, the gay community would have been unheard of, uh, but thankfully social norms have changed and now there are ads and things uh, for, the, for the gay community and other specific ethnicities and things like that. So it really does s sort of prove my point. It really does come down to business. So uh, thinking about products, uh, some obviously are very important to people of certain sexes, uh, perhaps uh, uh, feminine hygiene products, male uh, shaving cream, whatever, things like that, um, and geographic location. Certain parts of the country aren't really going to need to be advertised snow tires or something like that. Uh, ethnicity, uh, certain ethnicities are going to eat uh, more rice than other ethnicities. I'm married to, a, to an Asian lady and we go through a lot more rice than I ever did when I was single or when I was growing up. And uh, Hispanic, where, where there are concentrations of Hispanics, uh, 
studies show that salsa sells a lot more, more in Texas and California than, say, Wisconsin or Michigan or something like that. So that's partly how ethnicity uh, can come in. And age. Uh, it shows skewing for older people. Uh, if you watch the evening news, it's really kind of funny because so many of the uh, advertisements are for pain relief and things like that. Uh, and sometimes even for uh, like adult diapers and that sort of thing. So if you want to uh, kind of open your eyes, watch a, an over-the-air uh, network newscast and check out the ads. Check out the ads. They really do skew kind of old. It's, it's really kind of weird. And, and you can check out maybe the Cartoon Network or MTV or something where the ads would skew uh, much uh, much younger. So the early methods to determine ratings, they, and they tried a lot uh, in, the, in the very early days, in the 1920s, they thought the telephone calls would be a good way to go, but back then a lot of people didn't have telephones, and so they were missing a big part of the public. And uh, you have to remember that ratings are very closely aligned with polling very closely aligned with polling. So a lot of this stuff that I'm going to talk about with ratings today is also, uh, aside from the, from the people meters and so on, but it, it also relates to our uh, elections and things like that uh, and how to contact people. And there was an early presidential poll uh, back in, maybe in the 1920s, and they called people on the telephone and they thought one candidate was way ahead, but it turned out the other candidates uh, audience or constituents at that time didn't really have very many uh, telephones. It was uh, uh, more uh, lower educated and southern and that sort of thing and so the results were skewed because a huge chunk of the population didn't even have telephones. So they are always trying to do better. They, they don't uh, provide bad information on purpose or because they're, they're, they're cheap and they don't want to spend the money. They really do want to get it right, Nielsen and Arbitron. So uh, telephone, okay, didn't work so well. Diary, uh, you can see some of the problems with the diary. Uh, a lot of times you maybe don't write in while you're watching TV or listening to the radio what program that was and now you're trying to remember what did I watch or listen to yesterday and even right now I'm trying to remember what I watched on TV last night. Now remember uh, if you are a what they call a Nielsen family you are voluntary. It's voluntary you get a little bit of money not very much but it's voluntary so uh, it, uh, to me it would be a, a, I don't know exactly an honor but I would like to be a Nielsen household because I would like to make sure that the programs that I watch are the ones that are uh, that get good ratings and so on. I would want to make sure that uh, um, uh, Better Call Saul or Westworld or whatever I watch, Simpsons, I would like to make sure that they are represented and stay on the air and, and all that sort of thing. And it is a way of being heard, that's for sure. So being a family, I would never look at it as uh, some sort of a hassle or, uh, or obligation or anything like that. It's really a way to put a megaphone right up to your voice for the programs that you watch or listen to. Today, uh, portable people meters are the current way in usage. It's, a, it's sort of an infrared thing. Uh, they did people meters uh, before and it would be in the house, in your household, and when you went into the living room to watch TV, you'd, you'd punch in your number if you were, uh, if you were uh, 01 or 02 or 03 or 04 or something like that. And then it could keep track of uh, who was in the room and watching TV. Uh, but we have to remember that just because you are in the room watching TV uh, or, or in that room or have entered your code, doesn't mean that you're actually watching TV. You might be uh, uh, in the kitchen, you might be uh, uh, reading something or scrolling through your phone or something like that. So uh, having, um, 
having just your number punched in doesn't necessarily mean that you're paying attention to the ads and, and, uh, and things like that. Um, and we, I think we would all suspect that that's true. Um, just because the TV's on and it's turned to a certain channel doesn't necessarily mean anybody's watching it. It could be the dog or the cat. Uh, but I think everybody knows that and they, they, sort, of, they sort of get that too. So a sample size is the number of people surveyed. And so this is a high-end chart of, I believe it's a presidential election, it's something like that, but it's just I wanted a visual uh, to go with, uh, to go with uh, some of my text here. And uh, so this is really kind of interesting. I think it's following, I'm trying to remember what this is even, but I think it's following some political candidates. Uh, so, and as I said, again, um, polling and television ratings are really like siblings. They're very, very close. The margin of error, very important, is how close to 100% accuracy. And if we think about it, really the only way to be 100% accurate is to ask 100% of the people. Otherwise, uh, it, it, it can be close to 100% accurate, but it's not going to be exactly 100%. So they have to take a sample, and the sample size is how many people they're going to survey. And getting closer to 100% accuracy means you have to sample more people, which can get more expensive, right? Getting a hold of more people. Uh, still in politics, it is over the phone. Uh, sometimes over the internet, uh, not for television though. And television, of course, is going to be people meters and things like that. But like I said, they are closely aligned, and so getting to 100% accuracy is very, very expensive too. So a margin of error is how far off you are depending on your sample size. So we've got 300 million people in this country, a little over 320 million, something like that in this country. And you would uh, think that you'd have to ask tens of millions of people for television or for politics, for political candidates, but that's not really the case. They actually, these, these companies, uh, they do a pretty good job of uh, getting a good representation, okay? It has to be a random sample. And if the country is made up of so many percentage of Hispanics and so many percentage of whites and blacks, uh, then what percentage of Hispanics are male and female? And what percent of those males and females are over 25 or over 60? And what percentage of those uh, Hispanics are, uh, live in the Northeast? Okay, all the demographics are going to come into play, right? So just find, just making sure that you've got just as many whites and blacks and, and browns and, and, and yellows and everything, uh, you still have to hit age, you still have to hit sex, you still have to hit um, education even. And so it's pretty complicated. It's pretty complicated if you think that you're going to find a sample that's random that's going to represent all the different demographic parts in the country. I mean, think about it. There's really a lot going on. So margin of error typically is about plus or minus 3%. And that can be quite a bit. That means that if one television program or uh, one political candidate has 45%, plus or minus means it could be 48 or 42. Okay, so there's a, there's a big 6% plus or minus. Uh, and the same for uh, candidates and so on. They're, they're, they think they've got the right people to determine what uh, number of people are watching that television program or are ready to vote for that candidate, but it can really be off by plus or minus 3%. And now that we are in a political season, I see some margins of error published. It's usually very small at the bottom of the page when I'm reading a poll about how candidate so-and-so is doing is that it might be even 5%. And I keep thinking, wow, that's a lot. So you're saying it could be 25%, it could be 30%, or it could be 20%, plus or minus 
So that's really a lot. So if you're looking at at uh, uh, elections and that sort of thing, uh, you you have to think that boy, it might be off by quite a bit. And the same goes through goes true for uh, television, also for Nielsen and radio for Arbitron. Uh, they try to get a good sample of of people that are going to be part of their Nielsen families and all that, but they could be off by a chunk. So for the Los Angeles television market, number two market in the country, somewhere around 4,000, really, out of, what do we have, 8 million, something like that, in L.A. County, or in the L.A. market, we should probably call it the L.A. market, which includes, you know, Orange County and, and, uh, and all the way out to the San, San Fernando Valley and San Gabriel Valley and up the coast and all of that, right? There's probably uh, 8 million or so people in that giant area. And the idea that they can get a pretty good, uh, um, uh, pretty good accuracy with four, maybe five or six thousand, something like that, but just a few thousand out of millions, uh, it's really astounding. And nationwide, out of uh, 320 million people, of course, there are there are infants, and there are very very elderly uh, types who uh, maybe uh, can't. Um, vote or, or, uh, or fill forms out, maybe they're hospitalized, that sort of thing. Uh, but really, out of 320 million people, the idea that you could get a pretty good presidential sample size of about 10,000, maybe maybe 12 or 15, uh, and get within 3%, right? Get within 3%. That's, that's really something. It really is. So there is a law of diminishing returns, and you will come up with this term over and over again and all sorts of things that you're uh, reading about. And uh, the idea is, is that more or longer is not always better. And to get a margin of error down to 1% or 2%, the sample size would be so high that it gets way too expensive. So let's think about the law of diminishing returns here for a minute. Uh, if we want to get within 5%, then we can ask 5,000 people. And if we want to get it down to 4%, we have to more than double that. We have to maybe triple that or something like that. Uh, but to get it down to 1% or 2%, they would have to be sampling millions of people, which would be way too expensive. So they usually settle for around 3% or so. And the law of diminishing returns, the, the, you get a pretty good bang for your buck the first few people that you survey, uh, up to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, something like that. But once you get the, the error rate down to maybe 3 or 4%, then you have to really ask tens and hundreds of thousands of people to get it down uh, to 1 or 2%. So. Uh, other ways to think of the law of diminishing returns is, let's say uh, you wake up with a headache, and it's a pretty bad splitting headache. So you think, I will take uh, a, a Tylenol or an Advil, and I'll uh, at least mitigate the pain a little bit. So you take one or two, and then you think, whoa, I've got a really, really bad splitting headache. I'm going to take 15 or 20. Well, we all know it doesn't work that way. And drugs don't work that way for sure, right? At a certain point, they, they uh, are not only not effective, but they can be kind of dangerous. Um, and if we think about other things like skills, let's say that you want to get good at playing a musical instrument, or let's say you want to get good at something in sports. Let's say you want to get good at playing the piano, or you want to get good at shooting free throws. So if you practice for an hour a day, you might get your free throw percentage up to maybe 60%, something like that, maybe 65%, and you practice for two or three hours a day, you might be able to get your free throw accuracy up to maybe 80%, something like that. So you want to be a really good free throw shooter, and you want to maybe be a really good pianist. Why don't you practice for 20 hours a day? And of course, it doesn't work that way. Fatigue would set in muscle, all that kind of stuff. You can't just shoot free throws or lift weights or play the violin or play the piano 
or 15 or 20 hours a day in order to get really, really good. Okay, the first couple of hours, you're going to notice uh, a great improvement in your abilities, but after, I don't know, two, three, four hours a day, uh, you're just going to get kind of tired and fatigued, and it's not really going to help you out. You can't just uh, practice, practice, practice for, for 10 or 15 hours a day. And so that is the law of diminishing returns. The first couple of hours, you're going to notice, uh, you're going to notice a big improvement, but after that, your improvement is going to flatten out. The curve is going to go up pretty sharply and then it's going to flatten out. So that is the law of diminishing returns. And you'll see it in all sorts of, all sorts of uh, things as you just read media and, and things like that. So another problem with just phone calling and things like that is a lot of people don't have landlines anymore. So whether it's for polling, television, things like that. A lot of people just don't have landlines. And the law states that people can call for polling onto uh, your portable phone, your, your uh, mobile phone, your, your smartphone, but they have to hand dial. They're not allowed to use computer dialing. So that is going to slow the people way down. Uh, and it's against the law. They do it. They do robocalls to cell phones, but it is against the law. You're not supposed to be able to do automated robocalling uh, to, to portable phones um, unless you're hand dialing. So anyway, uh, uh, Arbitron and Nielsen and all those, they are um, trying to obey the law, trying to get really good returns, just as the polling companies are for political elections. Uh, but if you're reputable, they, you kind of want to follow the kind of follow the law there. So we also have some new technical complications. Back to television here, and a little bit away from uh, politics and polling and that sort of thing. Time shifting. So time shifting originally, really originally with VHS, you can shift. You can say, well, I don't want to watch this program. Uh, when it's on, I want to watch it later. So a lot of people never really did get a good handle on recording off of VHS. So it's kind of uh, kind of complicated. In early VHS, you had to have the right channel on. You, you, it wouldn't tune the channel for you and that sort of thing. Um, so as someone going back to the early days of VHS and all that, I recorded all sorts of shows, the wrong show, or it was on early in the morning and I didn't put in the right date and all that kind of stuff. Thankfully a lot of that stuff got better with uh, digital video recorders, uh, DVRs, um, and uh, a lot of people can watch a show uh, later. What I do is I, I record just about everything, even shows with, with uh, commercials like The Simpsons or Breaking Bad or something like that, and then I can just zip through the commercials. So I rarely watch commercials unless it's uh, something that I want to see live, like maybe the Super Bowl or, or the Oscars or something like that. So advertisers uh, understand this, of course, and they want you to watch that show live for sure. That would be the very best. They'd be very happy if we watch live TV. And a lot of people do watch live TV. Uh, and I've mentioned this uh, to you, I think, before. We're kind of in a bubble. Uh, we're in uh, Southern California. Uh, young and tech savvy and that's not exactly the way the entire country is. There are a lot of people that aren't in that nice Southern California youth tech savvy bubble and they are still just turning on the TV and watching what's there in front of them and and so on. So uh, we have to remember that uh, we are not the entire country. And I could even say you are not the entire country because I'm not as young as you guys are, but I'm fairly tech savvy and have a DVR and all the whole rest of it. Um, so uh, advertisers would love for us to watch their programs live uh, and or at least on the same day. So if it's on at 6.30 or 7, at least watch it later that same day. And so we might ask ourselves, what's the big deal uh, about live plus uh, about live or the same day. And that is, 
a fair amount of ads are really uh, topical or time reliant. Uh, a lot of ads are going to tell us about the new movies that are opening up over the weekend. Or uh, the McDonald's is selling McRib sandwiches for one month only. Or that Macy's has a 24-hour uh, sale starting um, over the weekend. And so if we record our shows and then let it sit there for a while in our DVR, then um, we're not going to see the ad that uh, they wanted us to see, right? We're not going to see the ad. And believe it or not, even with DVRs uh, and people like me who skip through the ads, you're always going to see the beginning of commercials and the end of commercials. And they're sort of counting on that. Or you might even forget that you have it on a DVR and accidentally <laughs> watch a commercial. Uh, and they know that. They, they know all this stuff. They, they do their studies and everything. But still, advertising, it does work. Uh, national network television, it's still a thing. And you might say, when was the last time any of you watched a network television program? And when I ask my class in person, almost no hands go up, unless it's maybe something like the Super Bowl. Almost no hands go up. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, why is it still around? And why doesn't it just go away, right? Or cable. When was the last time you watched cable TV? Everything you probably watch is on Netflix. So why is there anything other than Netflix? Why is there anything other than streaming? And the answer is because we're kind of in a bubble. And there are lots of people that watch over-the-air TV, and they watch DVR TV, and they watch cable TV, and they are still a good business proposition. Otherwise, they'd go away. Otherwise, they'd go away. So, you know, just because... Um, almost no one in my classes watch these things. Um, we have to think that it's a big country out there and enough people uh, watch or listen to that stuff with ads and all the whole rest of it that it is still a good business. So networks would love to factor in time-shifted viewing and they know that a lot of their viewers are going to watch something days later, maybe even weeks later. Sometimes uh, when I have uh, a movie that I record off of, uh, off of TV uh, or a television show, I, sh I probably could pick a television show like, uh, like uh, Better Call Saul or The Simpsons or something like that, something actual television show. A lot of times I'm going to be seeing ads from months ago. They're like Christmas ads or summer ads or something like that. I think, oh, wow, that's been sitting in my DVR forever. I haven't, no wonder I haven't, uh, uh, what's going on here with all these crazy ads for these movies that have been out for ages? Uh, and that's because I've got a, a, a DVR with uh, a couple of dozen things on it. I don't get around to watching everything always that fast. So the networks uh, would like us to watch stuff within a week or so. And... That's not always uh, the case. And advertisers are thinking, well, that doesn't do us any good because we have uh, stuff happening this weekend. We have stuff happening this weekend. We want people to see that new movie. We want people to go to that sale. Uh, and so the compromise, the big compromise, and this is important, is live plus three. Okay, so that's important right there. Advertisers and networks... They have compromised. They have settled on Live Plus 3. If you can watch it within three days or so, then they'll be happy. Advertisers like same day. Networks would like a week. Right in the middle is Live Plus 3. And that's generally what is being used these days. So most viewers uh, of television are going to watch on Sunday. It's still the family day, even streaming. Even if you're watching streaming, most families are going to uh, watch TV or stream or HBO or whatever. Whatever they're going to do. And if you remember when you were little kids, you probably did stuff with your, with your family. When you got to be uh, teenagers and so on, 16, 17, you were probably on your laptop or your phone. But when you were little kids like these kids here, you were probably watching TV with your family and the big uh, nights of the week. Remember, prime time is 8 to 11. Prime time on Sunday, by the way, is 7 to 11. And uh, 
most of that would be on Sunday and then Thursday. And Thursday is important. They stack a lot of shows on Thursday. Thursday is a big night for TV. That's when Friends was on. That's when Seinfeld was on. That's when Cheers was on. Uh, ER, a lot of big shows from the past were on Thursdays. And that's because of uh, advertising for the upcoming weekend. For the upcoming weekend. So Thursday, a lot of big popular shows would be on TV, drawing a lot of viewers. And that's because of, of the weekend. So sweeps are when ratings are taken for all 200 plus markets and not just the top 50. So the top 50, and we're in the second market, but it goes all the way to the top 50 markets, are done overnight. Okay, so LA, New York, Chicago, whatever, all that, Dallas, Atlanta, Detroit, Cleveland, right? All the top 50 markets are going to be done overnight. And executives in New York City are going to get the results uh, right, bright and early that next morning. But there are still another 100 and... 60 plus markets, 164 markets at least, out there that aren't getting overnight ratings. And so they are done, they are done during the sweeps. They are done during the sweeps. And the sweeps, I think we've talked about this already, but there they are, November, February, and May. And for various reasons, November after the World Series, which used to be a pretty big deal, by the way. Now, I don't know that it would really affect television viewing. But after, uh, after the World Series, November, and before the Christmas holidays, and then February, after the Christmas New Year holidays, uh, somewhere kind of in the dead of winter, I guess. And then May, right at the very tail end, before the big break for summer. So a lot of stuff is going to happen on those sweeps months. That's when uh, a lot of television, classic television type, programs like Modern Family or, or uh, uh, shows like that would have uh, weddings or births of babies or big vacations or big guest stars or something like that. That's always going to happen on the sweeps month so they can sort of juice the ratings a little bit. So a pilot is a sample show made for a network and probably most of you no, this is from Friends, okay, done in front of a live audience. There they all are from a few years ago now. And a pilot, though, is a sample show made for a network. There was a little bit of a description of what a pilot is in Pulp Fiction, if you remember that scene that, uh, that we watched in class with Samuel L. Jackson uh, describing what a pilot is. And so uh, networks get piles of scripts, I don't know, two feet, three feet, four feet of scripts, and there are readers, and of course that's a job uh, that you might think about, but there are readers that go through all those scripts and they try to thin it out and try to thin it out, and they uh, will come to an agreement that these look pretty good, and the network says, well, it describes everything. It describes these six young people or these four young people or this modern family or whatever, but we want to see the cast. So cast it, shoot a trial episode. We want to see what the, how the interaction is. Uh, we want to see how these written jokes are live and we want to see, you know, what the sets look like and all that. We, we, we just, uh, we don't want to just imagine it. We're going to throw a lot of money at this thing if we like it. So let's shoot a trial episode. And so most shows go through and have a pilot. Even Game of Thrones had a pilot. And so that the network people can look at it and make a final decision before they, before they commit. And they're probably only going to commit to maybe six or eight episodes. But still, before they're going to commit, they want to know. Every once in a while, a big, big star uh, is going to commit to a television show. And they, they won't force that star uh, to make a pilot if, I don't know, if Jerry Seinfeld decided he was going to make another TV show for some reason, I don't think any network would force him to make a pilot. Um, and, uh, and it goes for lots of other uh, uh, producers and, uh, and actors and so on. But anyway, typical, a pilot show would be made. That's the sample. And then 
before some of these shows are even on the air, they would be presented to advertisers. So in the spring, normally it would be just about right uh, in March or so, March or April, and advertisers would go to New York City, usually, and look at clips from these pilots. Uh, probably not the whole show because there would be too many, but they might look at a scene, something like that, five or ten minute scene, and then the advertisers or their agencies would say, this show looks like we could sell our product on it because they don't really care how good it is. They're, they're thinking, is it, is it going to appeal to the right audience? What are we selling? Are we selling uh, products primarily to uh, males or females or children or families? Uh, if, you're, if you're a company like McDonald's, it almost doesn't matter. Just about everybody can go to McDonald's. Um, but if you're selling beer, you might be thinking, is the audience going to appeal to at least people over 18? So the advertisers are going to be looking at samples of television shows called pilots. And they're going to buy time. Basically, that's what they're doing. Is they're going to buy time and say, well, we want uh, one minute in this show, every show, right? Because we're going to run a couple of ads in that one minute, two 30 second ads. The showrunner is the person in charge of a TV show, sort of like a producer. Now, in movies, a lot of times that would be the director. Sometimes the producer in the old days was the producer during the studio system. But generally, if you're a Steven Spielberg or a Martin Scorsese or Christopher Nolan uh, or Quentin Tarantino, you are the primary creative force on that film. But that's not the way it is on television. On television, uh, it wouldn't be the director because a television show, they, they might make, if it's something like Friends, they might make 22 or 23 uh, episodes per year. And they might not have the same director every time. They might not even have the same writers. They would have a writer's room and then maybe one or two writers would be the primary writers on that show. Uh, the people that are there the whole time are the producers and the actors. And sometimes the actors... Um, can have quite a big say in the show. They know the character. They, they could say, my character wouldn't say that. And they probably know the character better than the director does, and maybe even better than some of the writers do. The only people that would know uh, that character better than the actor would be the showrunner. Right? And the showrunner, uh, it's, it's a, like a producer's position, but it's the one that's there all the time, overseeing the scripts and the actors and all that. So. The, uh, the showrunners, for sure, are the ones in charge, and they are the ones that are going to make the most money when that show goes into syndication, and that's very important, uh, getting all that money. Every once in a while, uh, actors uh, get to get some of that uh, income uh, uh, coming in, but uh, not always. Big, uh, uh, big stars like Seinfeld, uh, especially if your name is in the title uh, of the show, um, Frasier or Seinfeld or something like that. Um, otherwise, uh, they're going to get a lot of money, that's for sure, but the showrunners are the ones that are going to get uh, truckloads of money. All right, we're going to switch topic topics here for a little bit. We're going to talk about the quiz show scandals of the late 1950s. These uh, competition shows were rigged. The contestants knew the answers in advance. And this is the most famous one. We'll have his name up in just a second. They actually got pressure from sponsors for certain contestants. So it started off as a legitimate, as a legitimate uh, show that uh, they would give contestants a pretest or possible contestants a pretest and that's what they would do on on a show like Jeopardy today just to see generally how smart these people are and then they would come on the show but the the sponsors thought that the wrong people not uh, uh, sympathetic people or exciting people to sell their products were uh, on the show enough and they were asking really ridiculously tough questions too. So I, I don't know. I can kind of understand, you know, what they're what they're thinking of. Uh, but 
um, they started putting pressure on uh, the producers to keep certain contestants and let other ones sort of off the air. At its peak, there were 22 quiz shows on the air. 22. And if you think, or if you remember, this is the time of live TV, then this is the sort of thing that's pretty easy to do in a studio, right? You just need to, um, you know, where the host is going to be and what they, had, what they had, isolation booths and things like that. And that's where... Uh, uh, that's all they needed for, for a set. And aside from the winnings, the contestants weren't really um, paid unless they won the money. So there were an awful lot on the air. So Charles Van Doren, it was the best known of them all, and he had this legendary, legendary playoff that went on for weeks, actually went on for weeks, um, versus another contestant, Herb Stemple. And when you uh, look at uh, some of the quiz show scandal, uh, the, the link that I have, uh, you'll get to see them in person. And uh, Charles Van Doren, he came from a nice, uh, well-to-do um, New England family. His father had written things, and his uncle had written books and poetry, and his mother and all that. And they had a legendary, a legendary playoff. Now, at a certain point, and these were pretty smart people, um, but they were fed the answers. And more than that, they were told, uh, mop your brow, sigh. I mean, it was like an actor. They were giving them total stage directions. And uh, I don't know, uh, uh, imagine, you know, imagine a show like The Voice or Dancing with the, you know, imagine that, uh, that the voting was rigged and that uh, the candidate that most people were voting for um, it was, it was, the whole thing was a hoax, or not a hoax, but, it, but, but was, uh, but was rigged. And so that's what happened with this. This is the most, he made it to Time Magazine and, and, and Life Magazine. And he had a, he was on the Today Show and all that. Um, so quiz show, quiz show camp, champ, Charles Van Doren, there he is, uh, wearing the headphones that he would wear when he was in the isolation booth back there so that people couldn't shout out answers or something like that uh, while he was there. Mostly it was for drama, I think. Um, but, so that, it was the quiz show scandals that happened in the 1950s. A lot of people still were fairly trustworthy of the government and television. Uh, for most people, television wasn't even a decade old in 1957. A lot of people really didn't, only half the people had televisions by, I think, maybe 55 or so, or 56. So it certainly wasn't, over 90 percent, uh, closer to 100 percent, and it was pretty new, and people were sort of trusting it. It came into your home, and they're sort of trusting it, and to find out that uh, they knew the answers ahead of time was really pretty shocking. It was re very shocking. So when the scandal started surfacing, some contestants, they went to the press and said, you know, this isn't really happening, and and we're told the answers ahead of time, and the press was like, what, this, this can't be, this can't be. And, uh, and, you know, they didn't really have direct evidence. Finally, after a year or so, one contestant um, sent himself a registered letter uh, that said that he, that he knew the answers ahead of time and all of that, and this was the answer for question one, and this was the answer for question two, and so on, and he sent it to himself registered. So that was pretty irrefutable type proof that he knew the answer ahead of time. Uh, but for the most part, most people, even in the press and the public, didn't really want to believe that. And when they had hearings at the grand jury level in New York City, Van Doren and many others, most of the others, lied under oath. They lied under oath. So that's, that's important. That's called perjury, lying under oath. A lot of times, the cover-up is worse than the crime. And we've seen that with presidents and other people. You know, the fact that you get caught, it's embarrassing to get caught. But once you're under oath, you got to stop lying. You can lie to the to the. Uh, police, you can lie to the press, you can lie, 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 really, it's not a good idea, of course, but you can lie, but once you are under oath, 
in front of a judge and jury, you got to stop the lying or it's big trouble. That's a big crime. You're not supposed to lie. Uh, you're not supposed to lie to the police and so on. But when you lie under oath, that is really uh, the big problem. So a lot of these people, they lied under oath. Um, and uh, the grand jury um, uh, the grand jury results were, were uh, sequestered. They never showed anybody what the grand jury uh, hearings uh, uh, had. And most of the contestants were let off with a warning were let off with a warning. I think it was just really a sad time for America uh, to think that this wonderful new medium that came into our homes and these wonderful people that we trusted in, I mean, these guys were really famous and everybody was saying, oh, Charles Van Doren, um, he's so clean cut and so smart and, and not, um, uh, not one of those rock and rollers like Elvis with his long hair and sideburns and swiveling hips and all that kind of stuff. He was really somebody that young people could look up to and he lied under oath, and it really was, was quite shocking for the country. It really was. It was traumatic. Okay, so, and uh, like I said, there's a nice uh, clip, and they made a movie out of it called uh, The Quiz Show Scandal uh, a few years ago. Uh, and um, so uh, watch that trailer, too. And um, like I said, it was famous enough to be made into a movie. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I've got some of The Quiz Show Scandal also for you to check out. All right, we're going to switch again and go to public TV. And it's just an example of a public TV program. Public TV is a little late to the game. A lot of TV was almost 20 years before that in the late 40s and certainly 1950 with Isle of Lucy and so on. That would be uh, over the air broadcast TV. But public TV took a while to really get its act together. In the early going, it was educational TV. And as you can imagine, a lot of people wouldn't be really interested in, in uh, educational TV. And uh, even some of our local Southern California stations, uh, this is evident in their call letters. K-O-C-E would be Orange County Education. And KCET would be California Educational Television, CET, California Educational Television. So even in their even in their call letters, uh, I was uh, re uh, referring to educational TV. So the second go around, they called it public TV. That seemed a lot better. PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, and uh, the government set this up, uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Congress set it up, and they are the ones that were going to sort of um, keep the public TV people uh, separated, and they wouldn't have to worry about money and all that kind of stuff, and outside pressure, undue pressure. So the CPB was going to set up the public broadcasting service and sort of stand in the middle there and, and keep them uh, from, uh, from outside pressure and all of that. But PBS... First off, they were kind of late to the game, especially in 1969. Now today, it doesn't matter if you're channel 400 or 200 or 2, but in the 1960s, having a VHF station, channel 2 or 4 or 5 or 7 or 9, that's really where you wanted to be on the dial. And they were mostly channel 50 and channel 56 and channel 28. So that was a problem right off the bat. Uh, there's also been political wars over funding. Uh, over the years, a number of uh, people have decided that they didn't really like um, giving money to television. Can't people watch this stuff on cable TV? And it's all for, um, you know, people that want to watch British TV, like Sherlock and things like that, and, uh, and upstairs, uh, 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 and, um, well, yeah, upstairs upstairs, downstairs, Downton Abbey, things like that, all these British TV shows, and classical music, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, one uh, side, uh, one political party in general, believes that it should be a free and open market, and the government shouldn't be stepping in and putting their thumb on the scale. And uh, the other political party thinks that government supporting the arts is a really good thing. They support the arts in France, and in Italy, and so on, and with museums, and art and scholarships for artists and all that sort of thing, and supporting the arts 
is a really good idea. So uh, it's different philosophical viewpoints, uh, money, taxes, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so there's always political wars uh, going on about funding for public TV. Yeah, some current hit shows, uh, Downton Abbey, I think it, Downton Abbey's Don and Sherlock. I'm not sure if they're going to make some more episodes or not, but I have linked to a, a uh, trailer for Sherlock and a few other public TV shows, so uh, you, can, uh, you can check those out. They're not very long, two, three minutes, something like that. But they, they do have hit shows just like, uh, just like over-the-air networks and so on. But their big ace in the hole, really, the big, the big, the big ace card for public TV is Sesame Street. And it is the most awarded show in TV history by a long shot. It's uh, 50 years, maybe even 51 years. I can't remember if their 50th anniversary show was in 2019. Maybe it went on the air in 1969, I think. So 50 or 51 years old. Um, and it has been franchised uh, to many countries in the world, Latin America, Arabic-speaking countries, African countries, Asian countries, and so on. Uh, and when it is franchised, then they uh, create characters that are maybe a little bit different. Maybe in Africa, uh, they have uh, different kinds of characters than, than birds and cookie monsters and things like that, and different kinds of buildings than these kind of buildings that you might see in uh, New York City area. This is called a brownstone, brownstones and all that kind of thing. This is sort of building you might see in New York City, but when they have uh, franchise versions of this for Latin America, uh, it might, might have an adobe look with different kinds of characters uh, in it. And I know uh, from talking to my students that some of them actually grew up uh, in Latin America uh, watching Sesame Street. And Sesame Street is a really important television show, and part of the reason it won so many awards and continues to win awards is that preschool is very, very important. And a lot of kids don't have the opportunity to go to preschool. So Sesame Street is going to fill in that void. And uh, studies have shown that kids that go to preschool are going to do better all the way through, all the way through life, as it turns out. Uh, and they have tracked kids from preschool age to the military and find out that they people that have gone to preschool, that's before kindergarten, that's the year before kindergarten, preschool, have done better throughout their entire lives, believe it or not. Less time in jail, better grades, go college, all that, all that. It starts so young with socializing and uh, learning to share um, and just learning your ABCs and learning your numbers, right? Even before, when you, you don't want to be behind on your first day of kindergarten, and that's kind of what happens. Uh, kids that don't have uh, the opportunity to go to preschool for one reason or another on their first day of kindergarten are already behind. And it's hard to catch up, right? You could be behind like practically for your whole life. Uh, kids that go to preschool, they do learn things about sharing and, uh, and how to get along with kids and all that other sort of stuff. Um, so uh, it is pretty important and so Sesame Street was created to fill that void, at least to show kids, maybe they're not going to learn exactly uh, social interactions and things, although they're, Sesame Street, they're going to talk about it, but they are going to hopefully learn their ABCs and their numbers and things like that. And Sesame Street has been pretty forward-looking when it comes to uh, diversity and so on. Uh, all the way back in the 1960s, they've always had a very diverse cast of uh, white and black and brown and yellow and all the all the uh, uh, kids and so on. The characters, of course, are yellow and purple and green, so they can be just about any race. They are Muppet race. But uh, they have also uh, been pretty early uh, showing kids in wheelchairs on Sesame Street, uh, showing kids uh, with uh, Down syndrome, showing kids with um, on the uh, on the autism spectrum and talking about that, and maybe you have a friend uh, like this, and she doesn't like to be touched or something like that. So they're teaching these little four-year-olds about kids 
on the spectrum and different races, uh, and uh, they have the top-notch educators and psychologists helping them out, but they have done a wonderful job of really helping kids out in those early days. Kids don't know that they're being taught by such uh, a brilliant and amazing people, but they really are. And I have a, I'm sure I have a link to a Sesame Street trailer for their, uh, uh, I don't know, 50th anniversary, something like that. So also on public TV is Ken Burns, and he does documentaries for PBS. He has the biggest audience in PBS history with his The Civil War from about 20 years or so ago, but it still has the record for the biggest audience in PBS history. Other documentaries by Ken Burns, uh, and they're big, big documentaries. So if you're into baseball, it's, I don't know, nine or ten hours of baseball, jazz, uh, Prohibition. I love the one on Prohibition. It's a little shorter. It's like three hours on Prohibition, something like that. It's really a good one. There's a nice one on Jackie Robinson. Uh, the Vietnam War one ran just a year or so ago, and it's just amazing, really was. And they looked at the Vietnam War from all sides, from not just uh, the U.S. military, but the Vietnamese military, and the domestic front at home in America with uh, Vietnam War protests and things like that. So uh, when Ken Burns does a documentary, he he does it all the way, 360. He does the whole thing. And the, the one that uh, is most recent was on country music. And I'm not, uh, I have to admit, I'm not a big country music fan, but I watched the whole thing because I'm a Ken Burns fan. And it was really good. I learned so much. I really did. I learned a lot uh, watching the one that he just did on country music. So you can watch any one-hour uh, Ken Burns documentary, and I believe he put a number of his documentaries back on PBS for streaming. So uh, any one hour is is pretty good. You might get sucked in and watch even more of that, but uh, he's sort of a national treasure. Um, they even have a Ken Burns effect in uh, some of the editing programs. Um, iMovie, I think, and some stuff like that. They have a Ken Burns effect. Uh, and, and that is, I'll, I'll tell you, the Ken Burns, uh, his uh, program on the Civil War, of course, they didn't have video or film of that, m mostly just photographs. Luckily, we had uh, lots and lots of photographs of the battles and, uh, and Lincoln and Lee and all of that. And instead of just showing a photo of a battle, uh, Ken knew what everybody who goes into video production is, is you can, you can actually pan and tilt and zoom within the frame of a photograph. So if it's a big battle, you can start uh, tight in on a body or on a soldier and then zoom out to reveal the entire battlefield. Or you can reverse and start with a big shot of a battlefield and then zoom in on one particular part. So that whole zooming and panning uh, thing became Ken Burns' effect, which is kind of cool. Public radio, and I could have put radio uh, a little bit earlier when we talked about radio, but I thought I'd uh, put it in here when we we're talking about public TV. And so public radio, uh, Congress gave them the little used and not very valuable FM frequencies, FM 88.1 to 91.9. And back in 1970, uh, FM radio was not a place where most people went to to listen to uh, things, music, or talk, or news, or anything like that, but today it's really prime radio territory, uh, FM. Uh, it's almost a complete uh, uh, reversal. Uh, so many people don't listen to AM radio anymore, if they listen to radio at all, and FM is really the place uh, to be. Um, so some of their biggest uh, audiences, and they're some of their best programs, All Things Considered, uh, is um, radio's biggest audience for news, and the networks have kind of abandoned radio. They still have their television networks and all that, but they pretty much abandoned radio, and so the uh, National Public Radio Network has the largest uh, radio audience. And uh, most of our podcasts that we listen to come from uh, public broadcasting, whether it's uh, whether it's um, uh, some of the stuff on the economy, 
or uh, on the media and things like that. So you have already been listening to some public radio podcasts for your podcast reports. Radio Lab, really good show. One, one of the top rated shows, depending from week to week, but usually it's up there pretty high. On the media, we've listened to some of those, Planet Money and so on. They're all on public radio and uh, extra credit and so on. And here we have KCRW and KPCC. And I'm sorry I don't have the ones in uh, Riverside, which is a little bit uh, um, still close enough. Um, but uh, those are the ones, those are the, the L.A. Uh, ones, but Riverside also has uh, public radio and public TV as well. Moving into cable TV, it began as community antenna television, and that's kind of important. Uh, there were bad, there's bad receptions in hills and mountain areas, uh, even in Pennsylvania and uh, places like that, even back east, not the Rocky Mountains, but even, even back east, they had trouble with uh, reception in hill areas and things like that. And one enterprising person put up a big antenna, not that one, but a nice big antenna and ran cables down into the valley. Now uh, remember if it was over the air, it would have to be line of sight. So if you were on the, on the uh, shadow side of the canyon or the valley, uh, then you wouldn't be able to watch I Love Lucy or something, something like that. So uh, that, that was really just because of bad reception. 1975, and HBO begins showing movies, home box office, by the way, HBO, home box office, and they have satellites in geosynchronous orbit, which means these satellites circled the Earth once every 24 hours, and since Earth rotates on its axis, once every 24 hours, you can sync it up, and it will be in sync over the earth, geosynchronous. Nineteen seventy-six, and another enterprising person, entrepreneur Ted Turner in Atlanta, and he had a television, a local television station, and he redubbed it TBS, which it, which would be Turner Broadcasting service. All the T's in there stand for Turner, Turner Network Television, Turner Classic Movies. Um, and so from Atlanta, he wanted to make his Atlanta Braves a big nationwide sort of a system, and he thought by broadcasting them nationwide on this new satellite uh, super station that he could turn his, turn his uh, Atlanta Braves into a nationwide team. It didn't really work out that way, but he went on to found really some important networks, okay, or really, between uh, uh, CNN and, uh, and uh, uh, TNT and so on. Um, he was really one of the founding fathers of cable TV. He's still with us. He's not running CNN or anything like that today. And CNN, really, 24-hour news, uh, that was really, that was really something. That was, that was kind of, uh, uh, a lot of people thought it was a crazy idea. Who would want to watch news 24 hours a day? But uh, Ted uh, gave it a shot and uh, turned out to be a pretty smart move. So let's look a little bit at some of these cable TV networks, just in case you're a little bit fuzzy. And, and uh, let's start off uh, with uh, ESPN. And a lot of this stuff is in a timeline in your syllabus. Uh, so it's all included in your syllabus. But in any event... ESPN Entertainment, I love that, Entertainment Sports Program Network um, began in 1979, and most of this stuff um, uh, from ESPN and from MTV and CNN were all 1979, 80, or 81. So uh, th that's really when um, cable started finding its, uh, finding its footage and by the mid to late 80s, then cable TV became uh, much more of a, a, uh, of a need to have. 1980, CNN, the Cable News Network, came in. And again, uh, Ted took a lot of, uh, a lot of people laughed about 24-hour news, and now we have... Uh, Others, two or three other uh, news, although there's a lot of talk and opinion 
and not really 24 hours of news. Uh, but when CNN began, it really was a news network, 24-hour uh, newscast. It sort of they would recycle and cycle, but uh, they were the they were the 24-hour newscasts. And we'll talk a bit more about CNN when we get into uh, news TV. Also, MTV, music, television, and uh, from their early logo, the, the man on the moon there, uh, jumping a little bit. Um, and uh, I've linked to um, some fun stuff of, of MTV. They're really, their peak was the 80s, and music videos were really a big thing in the 80s, uh, whether it was Duran Duran, or whether it was Michael Jackson, or Peter Gabriel, and everybody, Madonna, uh, everybody was using music videos to sell their music. And now, of course, they're all on YouTube and so on. Um, but uh, before that, if you wanted uh, your music, uh, then MTV was the place, and it was only available on cable. So a lot of people got cable for... Uh, some of these channels, right, for sports or for news or for music, right? That was kind of the that was kind of the thing uh, to get a to get a, uh, a reason to spend that extra money for cable. If uh, like me, I uh, lived in Costa Mesa and Long Beach. Uh, my reception was always pretty good. I wasn't on the back on the shadow side of any uh, hills or valleys or mountains or anything like that, but. Uh, I wanted uh, HBO, and I wanted MTV, and ESPN, and all that. So uh, th these are the really the channels that really put cable on the map, these, these three in particular, uh, CNN, ESPN, and MTV. <clears throat> 1984, TV's big three networks, we've talked about them, NBC, CBS, and ABC, uh, they peaked at 90%. 90% of everybody watching TV would have been watching one of the big three. Today, maybe 15%, depending. They might do a little bit better uh, with a Super Bowl or something like that. But uh, that's that's shocking, right? That's really shocking to go from 90% to 15%. So um, I know it's before most of you were born, but uh, not before your parents were born. So in a, uh, in a lifetime... A big, huge change in in television viewing habits. Cable TV reaches 50% of U.S. households uh, somewhere around 1985, um, and uh, this wouldn't be a 1985 flat screen TV. But uh, I love that it's definitely a cable sort of a hookup here with all the wonderful thick cables running all over the place. And so that is a big change in our mass media class somewhere in the 1980s. Uh, we go from regular television, regular radio, regular newspapers, regular records, all that stuff, right? All that stuff was uh, 30, 40, 50 years old, and then the 1980s rolls around, and we get cable TV and satellite TV and streaming and DVDs and all that, right? So... So 85 is, is a big change, period. So a little bit about cable TV. It starts as narrow casting, like magazines. And magazines uh, have very specific topics. There's one, you know, one for brides, and there's one for cigar smokers, and one for wine drinkers, and one for skateboarders, and one for... Uh, skiers and snowboarders and all that sort of thing, and one for Civil War enthusiasts. There are uh, tons and tons of magazines, even at a Barnes & Noble. There are uh, somewhere around 1,400 magazines. And so cable TV kind of was like that, very, very specific. One for sports, one for news, one for music, and so on. But in the 2000s, we are starting to get much more original programming. HBO's The Sopranos, Game of Thrones, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, um, all that stuff coming along with original programming. But for the most part, cable TV was just rerunning uh, network TV. If you turned on uh, USA 
or if you turned on TNT, you were going to just get old episodes of Taxi or Cheers or Seinfeld or Friends. Basically, that's what cable TV was for its first bunch of years, was just uh, uh, reruns of uh, syndicated off-network television programs, all the hit TV shows from back then, I Love Lucy, all that stuff. Then, original. Tons and tons of original stuff, and really some of the best TV out there coming from, uh, coming from cable. 1987, the fourth TV network, Fox, was launched. And there we go, The Simpsons, 1989. So 30 years, 31 now, and, and more, and counting. And uh, Fox was the fourth network. There was also a fifth and sixth network, and then they got combined down to one network. 1994, the first satellite TV, direct TV is introduced, and then DISH comes out right after that. 1996, we've talked about the Telecom Act, and that's going to allow cable and phone companies to compete. So you can get your television from a phone company like Verizon, perhaps, something like that, and you can get your, your phone service from maybe a cable company. So that was supposed to uh, lower prices, all this competition. Uh, I'm not sure that it did very much, but that was supposed to happen anyway. DVRs in 1999, TiVo, time shifting, seriously time shifting. Uh, I mentioned before that you could time shift with VHS uh, recorders and tape and all that sort of thing, but it didn't really happen that much. But uh, now with, uh, with uh, DVRs, uh, time shifting becomes much more of a thing. So uh, network TV, advertisers, all that, they counted on most people watching shows on the same day, uh, that whole uh, uh, live plus three or seven or whatever was not a thing until we get um, into, basically into this millennium. Netflix, also 1999, and maybe you know that Netflix began as a mail system. You would choose which DVDs you wanted to be sent in the mail, and the reason for that was they didn't have enough bandwidth to run that much video, right? Video uses up a lot of bandwidth, even standard definition video, let alone HD, so uh, you would get a DVD in an envelope in the mail, and there would be a return envelope. So as soon as you were done watching whatever you were watching from Netflix, you would put it back in the envelope, and when they got it back, then you could get more DVDs to watch. They started streaming. At one point, they uh, you could get DVDs in the mail and stream over the air, and they decided to split that apart, and a lot of people were quite upset. The, the, a lot of people thought that they were going to get a pretty good deal with DVDs in the mail plus streaming, uh, but Netflix was uh, was right about that. I don't know anybody that gets DVDs in the mail from Netflix anymore. Maybe they've even stopped. I don't know, uh, but uh, Netflix, barely 20 years old, and I don't know how long their, their actual streaming has been. I don't think they were streaming for a few years. UPN and the WB networks merge, so the 5th uh, and 6th networks merge, and now we're down to the 5th network, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and the CW. Um, so, there we go for over the air. Everybody still watches over the air, but it's still uh, considered over the air, and they're still uh, under the FCC's uh, direction. HDTV is the new U.S. standard. It replaces the old NTSC system that had been around since the 1920s or 30s. So um, 
75, 80, almost 80 years on one system. Like I said, a lot of stuff changed. At the, stuff's changing this, this millennium. A lot of stuff changed in the 1980s with uh, cable and satellites and all that kind of stuff. And then changing kind of again in the 2000s uh, with flat screen TVs and internet TV and streaming and all that. Cord cutting is the term for dropping cable TV. I don't know anybody that literally cuts the cord rather than unscrews it. But anyway, that's the term. Dropping cable TV, getting your TV uh, streamed over the internet. And we have a test. I'm going to try to figure out how to do that. Um, and uh, so stay tuned for directions on how to how to take that that test so let's uh, let's don't worry about that uh, for now I will let you know uh, when and how the test will be available in the meantime thank you so much uh, for attending virtual attending uh, mass media electronic media class number nine and uh, we will start a new topic uh, next week. I'm not sure what it is, but we got a new topic coming up next week and stay tuned. Uh, until then, Professor Dave Eccles signing off. Take care, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon.